there was the family in extreme grief. And the mother looked at me and her, I'll never forget the look in her face, um, where she said, we need to fix this environment. It was like, let's do this. Let's, let's create the space. We just locked eyes and we're like, we're doing this. It felt as if I was walking into just whoosh, right where I needed to be. This is the Ruby Hour. We're breaking into the vault of today's most brilliant minds to extract raw, actionable insights. This show is produced by Ruby Riot Creatives, the Austin, Texas video content marketing mavericks who help B2B and B2C businesses dominate through unparalleled strategic creativity. Chief Cat Herder Shelby Ring is your host. Claws out. Get ready to shred. Welcome to the rebellion. Okay, checking this angle. It's too short. <laughs> You're good. It's too hot. <laughs> Moment of truth. Moment of truth. How's it look? Cool. Melanie. Holy Shelly. cow. Mm. You're here. We are recording. <laughs> this is happening. So, I always like to start an episode off with introducing who are you to me in the world. Mm. So you and I met from, shout out to Meadow Coffee and Tea. <laughs> yes. We were just enjoying our coffees and I noticed that you had a nutmeg grater, like a baby cheese grater on your table and I thought it was the coolest thing and strike up a conversation. You just came back from Indonesia. You, and it was, that was such a token of a chapter of your life you were just mm. relishing and living in a, a bit of nostalgia with nutmeg so we met because of your funky <laughs> little cheese grater your nutmeg grater yeah for sure so speed up and recognizing we both love free diving scuba diving mm. the underwater world um yes. our adventure gypsy souls and that was our ground zero. And that was years and years ago. So when I think of our friendship and I think of who you are in the world, you are unlocking these tools for people to go beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. And it's such a theme, not only in scuba diving, but also in intrinsically who you are. Mm -hmm. So we're here today and the thing that I want to dive into is a dive through cancer. <laughs> Your yes. amazing brainchild soul journey that's finally here. It's finally in the flesh. Yes. So mm. why did you want to make a book? Mm. Oh my gosh. It's one of those things I've dreamed about writing, being an author, and it's always been shuffled behind a lot of other dreams. And before this whole experience happened, which allowed me to go deep enough to write a book, I had been writing scientific papers and I had gotten published with those and it felt so good to, to put something in print for others to read. And so I then began writing some blogs and getting those on socials and different online magazines and those were starting to resonate with people more. The science is very a small community in which it would resonate for those who A, either paid a lot of money for it, or B, were in the scientific community. And these blogs I was writing about my heartbreak at the time were just touching lives and people were just commenting on them and it was just feeling so soul-led. And so the next progression of that was to write a physical book and I've always dreamed of smelling the pages and just knowing that those words are there in a physical, like, 
hard copy that people can take with them to the beach and it's not just stuck in this database that only a small part of the population has access to. And here it is. And here it is! And we can smell it! <laughs> Ugh. I mean, so I went from saying you you teach people how to go beneath the surface, you know, you teach them so many water skills, free diving skills. Mm. You were in this amazing trajectory in that part of what you offer the world, and then you had breast cancer. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting at gala desserts mm. and having that conversation by the window, and you were 35 at the time, and it completely blindsided your world. Yeah. So in this book, reading this, you know, you know, but when I began reading this, it wrecked me. It utterly wrecked me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to expect of, okay, it's um, some type of cancer story, survival, memoir, dropping into the experience. But reading your book felt like a mix of a thriller because... I think I know for me it's one of my biggest fears is something that stops me in my tracks for what I'm doing in my career or what I'm trying to build in life and it read like a thriller it read like the most beautiful poetry and this insane just saga mm -hmm. that sometimes didn't have an answer but I want to just geek out the biggest one that caught me was the chair Mm, the yeah. way you describe the chair when you first began your treatments. When you were writing, was it visceral in the moment of how you were perceiving things? How did you drop into, because you took me into the moment with that chair and seeing mm. had the way it held you, the way it held so many bodies. How did you create that moment again? Yeah. That infusion chair. <laughs> Unforgettable. You know, I just, I want to backtrack a little bit in your question because going through the experience was part of me being able to deliver it. And before I went into the experiences, I was um, very present trying to be very mindful and present to feel all the feels, be open to all of the things that were happening around me and just soaking it in like a sponge. Like, I don't want to forget this part. I don't want to forget these parts and these need to be communicated. And this is something that we all feel. And so all of those were kind of absorbed inside me like a sponge. And then when it came time to write, I actually took a month off of my life. I, I went to the Pacific Northwest and I squirreled in, in my friend's um, beautiful little cabin in the Pacific Northwest by myself for a month. And I wrote like my inner Ralph Waldo Emerson was coming out. But I, it was a lot of prep. It was a lot of uh, taking care of self to allow me to be able to channel and dig back into what it was I wanted to connect with others about. And so, you know, my days I was making space for yoga and meditation and before I would write, obviously lots of deep breaths and channeling the intention. And also with each piece, there are targeted emotions with each one that I wanted to portray for connection and so I would breathe through those emotions and just sitting and breathing in my body and just allowing it to come back up so it could come out through my fingertips onto the computer. Yeah. It was an experience. <laughs> it's like a time travel into these visceral moments. Um, the piece about your story is our story. Mm, yeah. Tell me more about that gentleman. 
It was very profound because here I am waiting to get my blood draws to go through chemotherapy and the waiting room of the oncology office was so packed. There were people sitting on the floor, there were people in every chair, and it was so packed that we were out in the hallway. Out in the hallway, hoping that someone would crack the door and be like, oh, they're ready for you. And when we were out in the hallway, sitting, I was sitting along the side of the hallway, this cold, breezy hallway. Um, there he was, and we locked eyes, and I still don't remember his name, but his story was so impactful. And it was just like a tornado in the hallway when he was telling me the story. And I just remember thinking, I will, I will never forget you because this is for all of us to hear. And I needed to share it, um, not just for him because it's for all of us. It's, it's a piece of all of us. And all of the things he was describing, he just poured his heart to me. And my body was like that sponge, just like, okay, this needs to be shared. Mm -hmm. Did you know in those moments the significance? Did you feel a substantial, like here we are talking about it, but in those moments, did you have an awareness of how profound it was? Yes. I didn't know I was going to write a book. Um, that just felt timely and how it came to me as an opportunity. But yes, I, I knew when those moments were happening that there was a special place for them to be shared somehow or a lesson in it for me or um, it was very profound. It felt energetically just electrifying when these moments were happening and I being a witness to it was just so shooken. And it was such an alignment to be there to hear it. Like almost as if I was this messenger or this, I don't know, this like floating entity going through these experiences being like, what needs to be shared? What needs to be shared? And I wasn't thinking what needs to be shared. It was just coming to me like you had mentioned. It was, yeah, these moments were just, whew. And when you're so sick too, I was going through chemotherapy um, at that time when all some of these moments were shared, it really had broken down my ego so that I could receive that and hold space for it and just kind of file it away. What would you have done prior to that ego not being in a state of your guard was down, the ego was down? How would you have potentially interacted with that previously? Hmm. <sighs> I'm, I could only imagine that I would listen and hear and give compassion and then move forward. And although I did those things, I received it in a deeper way. I like almost like it had fused with my cells. I know that sounds crazy, <laughs> but it, it could land deeper and become unforgettable. And all of those feelings were all just landing so deep. And it was such a connection, like the, the ego taking a back seat a little bit allowed for the connection to be much more substantial and impactful. Mm. So cool. This mm. is the most beautiful, I'm like, what I would give to see what this person looked like you know, like a portrait, yeah. like my mind goes to art of like, mm -hmm. what a man. Um, it's so beautiful. I want to talk about the moment when you were getting your blood drawn and you tested out the words, I have cancer. Mm -hmm. What happened? Yeah, there is a short story, little poem about this in the book and it was, you're bringing up all of these moments that were very profound for me. So for you to feel that is, it's shaking me up right now too. Um, 
It was a lot of things. It, I just got done hearing from the oncologist or the, the breast surgeon that had cancer that was delivered the day before. And so I had just heard about the treatment required and they just bombarded me with all this information. I didn't even know if I wanted treatment. I'm just like, okay, just listening to this, go get your blood drawn, see if you have genetic markers. So when I went down there, it was a separate office and it was very cold. It was very, um, it's not a place you want to be. And, and even in doctor's offices, they're a little more welcoming, but this place in particular was just for drawing blood. And so we went back there and this woman had prepped my arm and I don't know what, what l led me to say it out loud, but it was the first time I had said it out loud to somebody else, you know, other than f my immediate family from the night before. And I, I said it to the stranger who I had never said it out loud to a stranger before. And when I said it, like she was prepping my arm and the needle came out of my arm and blood literally just decorated me and the seat and the room. And I had, when the needle came out, it cut me all across my arm too. So I was cut with blood coming out of my arm because she still had the tourniquet on. It was, it was, yeah, it was just all the things. It was almost as if just this sonic boom happened in the soundscape when the words transmuted out loud and just, it was very impactful and she was thrown back and very apologetic and tears in her eyes and yeah, prepped again. And we didn't speak after that. She just prepped, did the, okay, good luck. You know, it was one of those things where it happened and Let's move past it. And then you walked out like covered in blood. Like, <laughs> don't go in there. You know, I was like, yeah. Oh, I mean, I've had my blood done so so often for hormone panels, and mm. I just can't. I couldn't fathom like what would I do if that if I was in that moment. You know, just yeah. like, oh, gosh, like, and just you trying on the words, yeah. saying them out loud, like. That's, I was, when I, I was like, I don't know what to do with this, like. Yeah, that's how it felt. I mean, so you received that. That's how it felt for me of, I don't know how to, I don't know how to deal with this. That's, yeah, you, you received it. How I, oh, yes, Shelby. <laughs> what, mm -hmm. what are some of the things like, as I was thinking about speaking with you, mm. what are the things you wish you knew about the breast cancer journey that no one told you? That's a wonderful question. And I had wish I would have known that I would have to advocate for my health through the whole process and strongly and push for what I knew in my body to be right, what I knew in my heart to be right. There were so many times where everybody is overworked in the healthcare system and you become forgotten even though you are a cancer patient and these things happening to you and you need to speak up and you need to advocate and it's so exhausting, especially when you're going through treatments and going through surgeries and it never stops. It starts from the moment it begins from diagnosis all through the financial pieces that no one talks about, through all of the treatments and surgeries and post treatments and post cancer care it's something that uh, is part of the endurance of the energy that's required that I didn't know had to be. You would think someone would help walk you along this journey, but you are your own advocate and you have to fight for yourself. And I hate the word fight, 
but you you almost like I didn't like the word fighting cancer, but you have to fight for um, for your health and your wellness and for to be heard. You do have to fight a little bit to be heard. What are examples of like what would somebody want that would be like, well, I definitely don't want that type of care or like what are the things that they would push you along to do that are like, no, there's another option or route or I, I don't want this, this would be better for me. What are mm. some examples as someone that has no concept of the trajectory of treatment and, and the real care of it? The first thing that came to my mind when you just said that was breast reconstruction. Um, it was never brought up to me to go flat. It was expected that you'll have a double mastectomy and then you will get reconstruction and here's how it goes. And you're so young that you definitely need breasts. So that's just how the process works. And when they first told me that, I was like, that doesn't align with what I believe in and what I stand for. And it just didn't fit right. And even with me saying, I don't think that feels aligned. I, I, I think like, is there an option to go flat? Is there an option to not do implants? Um, and they brought up the option to do the uniboob for a while. And then eventually, you know, that would come off given my ex um, history and everything with uh, the genetics. And, um, yeah, it's just one of those things that was, it's expected. And unfortunately, it's expected for a lot of women. So it's just, just patriarchal system um, of, and I don't even know if that's the right term to use for this, but it's expected of women to have breasts. And for those of us who don't want to endure those painful surgeries, you really have to uh, stand up for yourself and voice what you need and do the research, which isn't presented to you. Um, the first person I brought it up to, my breast surgeon was wonderful. She had told me I was gonna have a scar from the middle of my left armpit to the middle of my right armpit all the way across. And I, going through treatment was like, oh, it feels like someone's taking a knife and just like cutting off your very vulnerable pieces and Oh, I couldn't land with that. But then I did the research and now I, I have like two, four inch scars. You know, there, there are other options that aren't presented, but there's waves of movements that are happening when women are starting to voice their concern about that. The whole concept of like, yeah, you're going through this experience. You're going to lose this organ, this functional part of who you are and then we're going to put like a, a dummy thing because well everyone just expects you to have boobs yes wow that's shocking that that's like something so obvious i would have thought like oh yeah like they're you know not having because you said for those of us that don't want to endure the painful reconstruction surgeries and you did i did did you do it just once? Multiple times. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about what was the experience like with the reconstructive surgery and why? Mm. Just tell me more. The reconstruction, well first the double mastectomy. They're cutting out the ends, they're cutting out all your breast tissue which starts even up here and goes all the way down. And it's more than I would ever imagine your breasts would grow into. They're cutting that out. And then for reconstruction, right? They're cutting it, they're scooping it out. Not the proper scientific sure. term. <laughs> <laughs> Melon butt. But, oh my gosh. But that inside of your breast is now raw. I mean, all the flesh was cut away from it. They've scraped it from the muscle and the bone. And all of that is, like, if you can imagine, like gutted. And so they're taking all that raw tissue, and then they try to put an implant in. And if the implant doesn't fit, they'll put what's called spacers in. So there are these little air balloons that they 
you regularly go in and they pierce them from the outside. They'll blow them up and stretch your skin so that you can fit implants in later. Oh. And I, the surgeon I had had wrapped my implants in cadaver tissue and so that it would help reduce that rubbing of the implant on the inside of all that raw cut out tissue. So on the day of the double mastectomy, which is a very long surgery, it's six or more hours. They're cutting that breast tissue, there's multiple surgeons in there usually, and I'm just sharing my experience. I know everyone has a different one, but I couldn't, the, the implants wouldn't fit because they took my nipples. They, mm -hmm. they made my breast pocket small, and even though I had small implants I requested, they still put those spacers in. So I woke up from surgery and I looked down and I'm like, oh gosh, now I have to go through another surgery because you can't end with spacers. Oh. So it's a little disappointing when you wake up and you're like, okay, another one will come. And then you're barely healed and you start going in for those skin stretching experience where they, you call them my air fills, like a tire. I'd go in there and they'd take this big needle and they would just shove air into them until you said, ah, enough. Like you would feel your, it was a weird feeling because they cut all the nerves out, right? So Whoa. you're feeling this like incredible sensation. Once your skin was stretched enough then you go back into surgery, they put the implants in. And then in my case, I had complications with the implants. So they had to go back and swap them again. And it wasn't until that third time where I was, I said, I had enough, just sew me flat, please. It sounds barbaric. Yes, and and to think of, ah, like that's the heart center, and to have all those hands in there pushing things inside and manipulating, and yeah, it it is barbaric. Mm. It feels that way in my body. Tell me about how your process has been reintegrating into your body. Was it like, you ring the bell, I'm cancer free, life is sunshine and rainbows? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> oh man, cancer recovery is, <laughs> I want it's a different layer of the experience. And in my case, it was a longer layer, it was a more intense layer, and it was a deep layer. Chemo was its own beast, but that recovery is the, a lot of people don't talk about it. And I have severe cancer related fatigue. And so I'm like, so tired. You know, people feel tired from the flu or COVID. That's me all the time for the last three years. I have never gotten my energy back, which is deemed a lot of people do experience that. So you've got the fatigue and then all this attention's on you and then it's gone. And so then you have this like feeling of isolation and then you have this new body and you're coming off all these medications that got you through surgery and were killing tumors. So you're kind of like detoxing the body from meds. You're trying to reintegrate into this new body while you're feeling this detox and you're doing it and it feels so alone. And um, it was, it's, right now is the first, I'm three years out um, to celebrate my third year cancerversary. So third year of non-detectable tumor. And I'm just now feeling like a piece of myself again. Like I, I can feel my soul back with my body because for such a long period, I feel the two disconnected to help me survive um yeah so it's that part I mean there's depression there's fatigue there's and it's a different kind of depression I've gone through those bouts in my life but it's like a um you don't even want to wake up just and it's the endurance of that is so long and varies with everybody so I think that's what was so shocking to me was following your cancer journey from afar, you know, just a vicarious friend of how she going, how she doing, where she at, what's, 
what's next, you know, always looking for those updates. Um, just what does life look like post cancer, post made mm -hmm. it through survivor, but like, as you're describing, no one is talking about the re-entry mm -hmm. to a new life and a new everything. Yeah, that's so true. And I appreciate the space to talk about that because I'm not the only one feeling that. There are so many people in this world who have experienced cancer in some sort of way. And I feel a lot of them just experience it in, in um, silence and go very inward and because it's so hard to get out of. And, and I have training of a yoga teacher. If I have these tools that I was gifted and had in my tool belt to help me climb out of the hole and not everyone has those gifts and, or those opportunities or that experience to be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna meditate. I'm gonna go to Vipassana. I'm gonna do these things that help me feel grounded. I'm gonna seek out natural healers and explore holistic medicine. And I can't imagine, and I kept feeling that, like feeling others in this experience of, how are they getting through this? I mean, how? Oh. So, and yeah, so thank you for bringing that up and raising awareness for that. One question that I had over and over, watching your journey, seeing the updates, as a friend, so a non-family member, what advice would you give to someone that wants to support, wants to be there for, for their friend and their friend's significant other or their family. What's the, how do you navigate wanting to be helpful without being overbearing? Yes, I would say the first thing that comes to mind is to just do action. Um, especially while someone's in treatment and someone's in surgery and recovery you're literally moment by moment, and you're just trying to get to the next hour, to the next moment. And for someone to reach out and be like, how can I support you? It's, it's too overwhelming. So what really impacted me were the people that just showed up, the people that just sent a text, I love you, I'm thinking of you, and didn't ask for anything you know, in return just support energetically and a reminder that you're not alone is so helpful. And I don't know, I can't speak f fully for caregivers, but if there's some advice I could share with caregivers, it would be to let the tribe help the person because a caregiver can't do it all. It's too big. It's such a support, a community, uplifting of a person and support. And if one caregiver or two, however many caregivers there are, try to do it all, they're going to lose that connection with their family. They're going to lose. They, they just, I needed support from the whole tribe. I needed my girlfriends there to watch Captain Ron with me. I needed, you know, people there to remind me of fun times diving or just little snippets of memories and maybe a little goodie here or there, a surprise at my door or just those things, at least for me, were so supportive. Mm. Tell me about your relationship with death now. <laughs> How do you see death? Yeah, it's definitely, again, like an onion where the layers have unfolded. And before this experience, I thought I was close to death, that I was very intimate with death because of my traumatic upbringing and some of my experiences. And then cancer, going through that experience had shown me, oh, 
you really aren't that close with death or you think you are. Hey, goodbye, ego. Let me show you. Um, and it definitely, my experience with death has evolved. And to feel every cell, most, not every cell, but to be able to feel the variety of cells and the wholeness of your body die during chemotherapy was such a unique experience. And you really do, you like feel like you die or you're about to just cross over and then you come right back. And so it's this constant feeling of death and rebirth, death and rebirth, death and rebirth. And even with surgery, like you go under for surgery, you think, oh, I'm gonna wake up. <laughs> and then you wake up and you're, it's, it's just, it has definitely changed. Um, and even so, it's one thing that's really struck me as interesting about this journey is that you know, death is something we all have in common. We're all going to die. And we, we don't know how we're going to die. And the thing about cancer is they tell you you're going to die or you, you know you're more likely to die because of this, uh, this situation. And it's something about the knowing of death and that it's coming, like, that's the real difference, I feel, between those who have gone through cancer and those who haven't yet experienced it. And yeah, that, that's just an interesting thing that I've been playing around with in my mind about that. And, but I have felt closer to death and like I, so much so that I haven't shared this. I don't know if I've shared this with you yet, but I've been called to work more in depth with death and support those who are dying. And it's, it's almost like death is a coming home of sorts, of a feeling of um, there's less fear around it and more acceptance. And it's a sacred experience. And I feel I just caught a little taste of that with my journey through cancer and um, made it less scary and more beautiful, more sacred. Hmm. How has life become more beautiful because of death? You notice the small details. And I was always a detail person. But you not only notice them, you feel them. And so I take, it slows you down. And so you're kind of in this more radical presence. I feel I have been, or I'm not even joking. Like I, I notice a dragonfly's wings fluttering and I can feel that air displacement or the joy of watching a mother and father with their two kids diving and just knowing that fleeting moment of joy, how it's like, um, my counselor had described it as this butterfly. It comes through and then it, it goes away. But just realizing that these joy is fleeting and it comes and it goes and it comes and it goes. But so knowing that a little bit more allows me to drop into the full feeling of joy and the full embodiment of it mm. through tiny moments. Mm. <laughs> oh. Wow. What, um, I'm thinking of a moment you shared of, um, a very dear loved one passing and how you came into the environment of someone transitioning. And can you share as much as is appropriate? But when I think of this moment, you changed the atmosphere mm. of that moment for this person and for their loved ones that were still here. Tell me how that ties into your experiences and, and please mm. feel free to expand on whatever to build context. 
Yeah. Oh. So this moment, um, the person this moment was happening for didn't experience cancer, but had experienced some really radical treatments of chemotherapy to undergo stem cell treatment. And so that experience of chemotherapy, that experience of death and rebirth, death and rebirth has always been something that had connected the two of us. And she, this person or she, she was nonverbal. And so it's one of those things we always energetically shared in. And I would, we, we almost bonded over it, um, the sharing of my experience with chemotherapy with her. She was one of those people in my family that could really understand what it felt like to receive infusions and experience those things. In fact, I had her picture of her undergoing chemotherapy next to my infusion chair as inspiration. If she can do it, I can do it. Um, but yeah, it was time for her to transition and it was just, I had walked into the room and we all know, knew it was happening and hospice was there and it was, uh, it felt a little chaotic at the time with the auction machine going and music playing or TV was on, something was on and it just was loud and, you know, there was the family and extreme grief. And the mother looked at me and her, I'll never forget the look in her face, um, where she said, we need to fix this environment. It was like, let's do this. Let's, let's create the space. We just locked eyes and we're like, we're doing this. Because she was, you know, holding the, the person. And so it just be, it felt as if I was walking into just whoosh, right where I needed to be. And so the ambiance was set, the music was changed. Um, I brought in some nature, brought in some grounding elements. It set the smell, like setting the space so that this sacred moment could occur and everyone could release. And, and then that was a small piece of it, you know, of surrounding this person in love. But there had to be that space to allow a release and with the chaos going on, it just wasn't open yet. And um, I really think that my experience through cancer and all of that had brought me from entering a space like that in the past where I'd be like, ah, oh, you know, especially because it's one of my family members, extended family members and to a space of, ah, oh, I know what this is. I know where we're going and we know we're going to do this together and we're going to treat it as sacred and we're going to celebrate you. And so it was, I'm not sure I would have been able to get there had I not had those experiences. It was the most alive I've ever felt in witnessing death. It really was. It's such a beautiful thing. I think that, um, Oh God, that story fucking wrecks me. Um, I think when I look at your life trajectory, you, I just couldn't have thought of a better path for you to be a dweller of the deep. Mm and a dweller of the darkness. And when we were fucking sitting at gala desserts, you were like, I feel like I'm getting called to the depths. I feel this call to the deep, to the darkness, and I just don't think it's by happenstance. And it's like, you were saying things like that bef when, before you even went through the journey. And I just think that you know, this story you just shared about how you were able to help make a bridge more beautiful mm. is such a 
a gift of your lifetime mm. and with their lifetime and the other loved ones that were involved and you're using language like it wasn't like the it wasn't open for her yet like mm. the portal or this sort of crossover the environment wasn't right so it wasn't appropriate for her to be able to move through mm -hmm. I think that environment because I think of I mean my my upbringing we the joke that I say to myself like nobody else I'm like you know the joke we say around my house but we didn't go to Disneyland we went to funerals like mm -hmm. my whole family lineage everyone was dead by the time that I was 11. And so wow. like all of my immediate loved one, except for, you know, my, my aunt and one cousin going to so many hospital rooms and funerals. And just, that was my, mm -hmm. you know, childhood to teenage, um, years. I know the room you're describing that is chaotic and is overwhelmed by other people's grief rather than in service of loving the person who is transitioning. And this story that you share is so profound to me because you had the eyes to recognize how do we shift this to, you know, how do you shift it to love? How do you shift it to being in service? Not, I'm about to lose my partner, my best friend, my me, me, me. And instead being like, instead of what you're about to lose, don't you want to just cherish them right now? Hmm. And what's the most beautiful way you can do that? Bring in some nature. Hmm turn the fucking TV off, <laughs> make it beautiful, make the sounds, make it a, you know, your senses oriented with something that they enjoy, whether yeah. they're conscious, conscious or cognizant or not. It's such an incredible story that mm. it lives rent free in my soul forever. <laughs> you know, it's just the way that this journey you've gone through and the hardships that I can't fathom, you know, no one else knows what it was like to be in your shoes, in your toes, in those moments. Mm -hmm. And yet the capacity that you have to meet death, like death, just meeting death mm -hmm. in a way that it's not fear-based. Hmm. That's rarefied error that you exist in. Yeah. And I'm sure there's still some fear in there for it. Um, but it's, it's changed. Like, I remember this moment um, when this person was passing. It was not one of those close your eyes, peaceful passings. They were gasping for air. They, they had their lungs collapsing and it was very intense um, to witness. But then my teachings came back. She was also one of my teachers. But through the experience, I remember when you're that close to death, you feel peace. You don't feel, I felt peace when I was that close to death. And when this was happening and the others were witnessing it and they haven't felt that yet, I'll never forget that moment. I said out loud, she's not feeling pain. And people say that when people are transitioning and you're like, but I've been there. I've felt that peace and when I had shared that like she's not feeling pain she's feeling peace and we need to love her and 
feel the feels, but just know that that's not what's controlling her. Pain is not surrounding her right now. And that shifted that whole story, the whole narrative of the experience. And I remember thinking when that came through in that experience, like, thank you. Whether she was giving it to me or reminding me as it was all happening. But there is this beautiful, full body peace and love and just, yeah, so just layers. It may not be that I have fear of the pain that I know of, but I'm sure there's other things in there, other little seeds. <laughs> but yeah, going through some of these experiences have definitely changed my relationship with it. Mm. What, in terms of practical things, how did you know you had breast cancer? Because, you know, we've chatted about this, but it's like, you know, they're like, oh, it's a lump. And it's like, sometimes my breasts, I'm like, I got all kinds of stuff going on. Sometimes they're sore, they're, it's the spectrum. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm not going around groping 20,000 other women's <laughs> breasts. So all these doctors that are saying, know what to look for. And they ask, are you doing regular breast exams? I'm like, I don't know. Like I squeeze my boobs sometimes. Does that count? Yeah. How did you like give me granular mm. things of how did you recognize something was different? Hmm. So I, I tell most people I found it on a self-exam because how I really found it would make a lot of people, <laughs> but I, I will share that. Um, I was changing my relationship to my breasts and, and learning how to love them. And this one teacher had shared their antlers of your heart and she was sharing how to do a breast massage. And that's what I was doing, um, breast massage. I was dropping in, you know, from I, Eros. Like I was learning to be comfortable enough touching my breasts, which allowed me to get up into the place it was, which is up near my armpit, because I was massaging. I was massaging the breast and pushing it towards the lymphs. And then I was like, whoop. It, it is not, I also have, had very lumpy dense breasts where I could feel things in there and I they were always sore yeah but when I felt that mass whew, it was like this radical presence it was so it was hard it felt literally like a pea and it was the size of a pea it was something that was not meant to be there and I knew immediately mm -hmm. um I went to work that day and actually I have a friend who's a PA in town and she's wonderful and I couldn't shake it. I couldn't shake it from that evening. I had slept on it. I woke up, it was still there. And so I'm at work with my shirt off in the changing room, touching my boob, texting her. Touch, uh, does it feel like this? How big is it? Da, 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 da. And we're texting, touching. My boss tries to come in. I'm like, whoa, 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 no. <laughs> Don't come in, something's going on. Um, but I had many doctors, or a few doctors tell me that it was just a cyst, I'm overreacting. Um, so I'd let it be. They're like, okay, cysts are round, you're young, you're 35, you don't have cancer. And I just kept an eye on it. You know, I kept an eye on it, just kept feeling it, seeing if it was changing, and then it did. It, it all of a sudden just started growing very quickly and getting really sharp. And once it- What do you mean sharp? What do you mean sharp? Almost as if like you have knuckles, like instead of being a smooth ball, you've got these knuckle feelings and you can kind of feel the bumps on your knuckle. It was like that. Whoa. It was bumpy. And it, the cyst went from smooth to like sharp like that. Um, and it went from the size of a pea to three fingers wide. Oh. All less than a year. Wow. So that was over the course of a year. Yes. Oh. I waited. So you, the pea. <laughs> the pea grew. Wilma. Wilma. Wilma the tumor. 
May she rest in peace. Yeah. But yeah, and then when I saw it on the ultrasound, you know, of a science background, I saw it wrapped in blue and red. Like it was feeding itself. It was, it looked like a heart and it had the veins and arteries wrapped around it as if it were, it was kind of like from space. You're like, what is this alien inside me? <laughs> but I knew immediately and um, all of the people that were working at the breast center, they said, who told you this was a cyst with tears in their eyes? And they're not allowed to tell you the results. And like many doctors told me, and um, they gave me the you can win this fight speech without telling me it was cancer, and then closed the door and I was left alone in this hallway like, what just happened? Uh. What just happened? Yeah, and then they give you a bunch of like medical terminology, and I remember going in for my biopsy. They call me right away, and this doctor is sitting across from me, and um, very attractive doctor, because I was like captivated by his piercing blue eyes, like, and um, I said, "Explain to me what BioRad Five means, like, in real terms, please." And I'm a scientist, like, tell yes. me the truth. And he's like, "It's." He told me. He told me the truth. Like, n you know, we hadn't even done the biopsy yet. He's like, BioRed 5 means it's basically we almost know it's cancer without just checking the box that we tested it. So, um, yeah, that's those are some snippets of, of that. That's wild. The the knuckles, the the sharp, the transitioning like that. Mm -hmm. So knowing what you know now and the P identifying this shape that's unusual, yeah. what would you recommend if someone was in that scenario now, knowing what you know, what would you recommend to do different? I don't, I don't think I would do anything different. Um, at the time, I didn't have health insurance and I had, was, trying to figure out how to pay you know these oh. tests are expensive they're so expensive and most people you know we're we're grinding and we're not thinking about spending thousands of dollars to have these tests when we're in our 30s I mean let alone women now are getting diagnosed even younger than that I feel like a more geriatric um, <laughs> diagnosis compared Gosh. to some people I've met in the facilities and um, so not having insurance, I was researching ways to get coverage and that was so stressful on top of monitoring the size of that. And my body told me when it was time and I really do believe, I mean, this didn't happen, but I believe it in my gut that if I went to the doctor when it was the size of a pea, that they would dismiss me completely and I would have wasted that money. There's part of me that believes that, and maybe that's just the story I'm telling myself, that I waited to the right time. I mean, they still caught it at stage two. The earlier they catch it, supposedly the better, but I really, um, I needed to feel it change shapes. I needed to feel that it didn't go away mm -hmm. as maybe even a part of integration for myself because if I would have run to the doctor out of fear, uh, you know, it just, yeah, I, I think that I waited until the appropriate time, but I, I kept prioritizing it. I kept checking in with, with everything. And um, so when it did get diagnosed, they acted extremely quickly, which was very much in my favor. But yeah, I mean, I would tell people that to just, you know your body better than any of these doctors. And if your body's telling you something's not right, you need to pursue and fight for yourself. You need to advocate for yourself. And even the doctors that I had, stage two triple negative breast cancer, the doctors during, two of the doctors during diagnostic tests said I was overreacting and it's just a cyst. So, I mean, you really just need to trust your gut and keep checking in with your body because your body knows your body will tell you.
Your body's such a great teacher. All of our bodies. Mm. What kind of doctor do you go to? Like, let's say you're like, this is weird. Do you go to your OBGYN? What doctor do you go to? It's a good question. Because no matter what doctor you start with, they'll send you to someone else. Yeah. Also. <laughs> so PCP would send you to someone else. Um, yeah, who I went to was through a program called the Best Chance Network, which is a state-funded program here in South Carolina that uh, helps women get diagnostic services for breast and cervical cancer. So they gave me a list of clinics to go to, and they were just kind of like run-of-the-mill, you know, clinicians that would send you to someone else. So it took me two doctors before I even made it to the breast care center to get a mammogram. Yeah, so you have to jump through the hoops. It doesn't matter. I don't think it matters who you start with. You just need to start. Mm -hmm. You need to start somewhere, whether that's like a college clinic or a PCP or yeah, your OBGYN. They're all gonna refer you to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Yeah. Because I think, you know, I shared some context in my world, but you know, the what do I do Mm. how do I, who am I supposed to talk to? And the fear of, I just found this thing. How many minutes do I have? Does every <laughs> minute and every moment count? You know, just that yeah. intensity of if someone, you know, listening is like, I think I found this thing or I have, I'm concerned. What's the practical process to, yeah. I, I just think for women our age, um, yeah, there's not a ton of things that are baked into our culture yet to yeah. empower people that are in their thirties for here's the actions to take and the things yeah. to consider. Tell me about being bald. Oh, being bald. You were a big, uh, part of that, making that experience so beautiful for me and so sacred and it's, I feel so grateful that I had this beautiful space of um, beautiful people such as yourself that were there for the transition and documenting it and um, sharing it with the world in such a beautiful way you do. That was the start of it. Um, I wanted to feel the whole experience. So a lot of people cut their hair first and then shave it. And they told me I was going bald and I would still show up to infusion. Like one day I curled my hair and he's like, Melanie, you're going to lose that. I'm like, I'm going to love my hair while I have it. Um, but that one infusion I had afterwards, my entire scalp felt like fire, like burning, intense fire. And I felt all of the, the root of my hair just drop, like go limp. My hair was still attached. I had quite long hair. And I knew after the first infusion, like the detachment process was already beginning of losing the hair. And then the second infusion, my oncologist reminded me, you're losing your hair, the cycle, it will fall out. But I still held on to it thinking, I want to feel what other women and men feel or other people feel when their hair falls out. I've never experienced that other than heavy shedding. So I left it and I had you guys on call and I texted my team that was doing this um, hair cutting experience. Like if it lines up magically for us to do it, let's do it. But let me tell you how I'm feeling. And it started falling out. It started falling out in um, just like super heavy shedding. It's funny, I would wake up in the morning and look at my pillow and be like, is all my hair gone? I would have nightmares about it because it was such a piece for me. It was really hard to let go of my hair. And I was very attached to it. But then it was falling out so much, like it was just, you would do this. And because I had long hair, it would just keep coming. And so I'd have to like spin it like you were wow. spinning spaghetti and to make sure you didn't lose any, and I was collecting it in a bowl. 
so I could monitor how much I was losing. Mine didn't come out in patches. It was just like all falling out. And um, there was so much in the bowl that I had lost at least, at least a third, maybe half of my hair volume within a 24 hour period. And so that's when I had messaged you all that it was time and I was ready to, to get rid of it because it was just at that point, just, I, I didn't, I had felt it, you know, I'd felt what I needed to feel. Um, when they cut my hair, Jeff from Lava Salon made just such a, a fun twist to it, giving me new styles to look at. He, I was like, I want to have a mohawk. He made me into a mohawk. You remember and the that? Euro, the Euro style. Yeah. <laughs> it was like very fetching. Was, yeah. Oh my God. I wasn't expecting that and I wasn't briefed that he was doing all those. So every time he brought out the clippers, I was like, I'm going to be bald. I'm going to be bald. And then I would have a new hairstyle. So that He's was like, fun. like, you look so good. <laughs> yeah. That was so, yeah, that was so masterful. Yeah, and you got to cut off a ponytail, too. <sighs> but hearing your experience with your hair, you had done something similar and a transition. It, it really stuck with me as strength. And um, those last clips, oh, I remember you captured, like, the tear. Of course, there was this sadness but there was this huge relief that I wasn't expecting. It's, you know, you're waiting for it to drop and you're stressed out about it. And then it happens and you feel free. You're like, oh, it's gone. I don't have to think about that anymore. You know, I'm going to rock this bald head now. I'd be grateful that my mother had a C-section and I don't have a cone head. <laughs> but um, the things you never thought you'd say. But it did. I felt fierce when I was bald. I felt like the world can see me and not my covering. And I had nothing to hide behind. And it didn't start off that way. You know, when I got bald, I was a little bit of woe is me, you know, and still little pins were coming through and really painful. And um, my partner would shave them off. And I was just kind of like head down about it. And then this woman, this woman, she was um, this cop, and she saw me bald, and she goes, don't you feel fierce bald? And it hit me like a tidal wave, and I like lifted my head up, and I was like, yes. And it was the moment that narrative changed for me, was that interaction with her. and. Um, I can only imagine what her story was, because if she felt fear spalled, you know, and because, I mean, she was the driving force of, okay, let's, let's get fierce with this. Let's mm -hmm. change the story. It's not a woe is me. It's look at me. Look at what I'm learning. Look at what I'm venturing through. And um, look at this chemo working. Like, yeah, let's, let's get our warrior hat on now, because no more pity party. And it really is all about the story you tell yourself, and um, I needed that reminder. So amazing. Oh, my gosh. Mm. Uh, Melanie, how can people find your book? Oh, it's available on Barnes & Noble. Oh, my gosh, it's weird saying that, right? Um, Amazon, my website. Which is? MelanieBachman.com. Right, spell it out loud. In yes, <laughs> I'm named after three grandmothers. It's Mel Annie, M E L A N N I E, Bachman, like the composer, B A C H M A N dot com. And you can find it at a more a special price for those who go to my website or, or on my social media. Um, I'm on Instagram at Melanie Bachman and um, there are links there where I can send you to the publisher and you can get a special cost on it. Beautiful. And, um, yeah. Well, any final thoughts, anything that you'd want to share for anybody that's going through 
their own cancer journey or have a loved one that's going through that any anything you'd love to say um i would encourage them to change their story because our minds are so powerful and if you change the narrative, you change that story you're telling yourself. Uh, I, I had this lesson from this little bug on my windshield the other day, and it's been so true through this whole experience of what story am I telling myself? Am I choosing to believe this is terrible? Oh, why me? I'm so afraid. And you just get caught in this why and I can't do it. and those are just stories you're feeding yourself. So what are you nourishing yourself with? What are you feeding yourself? And can you shift it? And maybe changing it completely is not in your practice, but even just a tiny shift, like a tiny degree shift can change where a plane lands across the globe from one spot to a totally different location, a totally different country. And so, and many of those even, if you just do it, not just for one story, but little stories and decisions throughout the day and moments throughout the day, just check in with what story you're feeding yourself. Um, because that has really changed my life. And I could just hope that um, if we all add that into our practice a little bit, that it would help encourage and inspire others and um, blaze a new path forward. Beautiful. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. I love you so much. Thank you for everything. Mm. Now let's make a massage video. <laughs> Holy cow, you made it to the end. Nice work. If you love this, let us know. The biggest way you can pay it forward is taking the next 45 seconds and writing our show a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Your feedback is the lifeblood of our show. And if you're sick and tired of hiring the one-off photo video production company, the next best social media manager, or frivolously throwing money at marketing just chasing more likes, then it's time for us to have a conversation. We specialize in strategic content campaigns that generate more qualified leads to make your small or mid-sized business more money. Get a full-fledged media department for a fraction of the cost of an in-house creative director. Email heyruby at rubyriotcreatives.com to get started. Until next time, live a life with stories worth telling.